Hi, I'm here with Jim Ponfiglio, who um, I have the opportunity to interview today. Jim, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. It was great reminiscing with you about uh, about uh, right days in Rochester. Yeah, thanks, Jim. So tell us a little bit about where you're from. I I'm from uh, Jamestown, New York. I graduated uh, Jamestown High in 1971. Um, then I went to University of Rochester. I went there for four years, um, played a little football there, played a lot of rugby there. Um, I got a JD, uh, JD got my, uh, um, uh, 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 <laughs> I'm having a stumbling effect. That's I got my degree in uh, history and political science. It was a double major at uh, University of Rochester. While I was there, I would go back and forth home, actually uh, worked in a foundry. So, uh, I, I, and, and now I'm a lawyer, so I know what it's like to, uh, to have to take a shower before you go to work and after you come home from work. So yeah, trust me, I know what you're talking about. My grandfather actually worked in a foundry in Pittsburgh. That's how I got oh, yeah, my. Yeah. That's that, that's what I was telling you. But that's how I got my last name. It went from Guerra to Gary. Right. That right. way. Well, um, uh, I did uh, manholes, manhole covers, grates, and rails. We melt the iron, pour, make the molds, and pour the iron. We'd have a, a day of casting and a day of making the molds. So. Um, I, I know what it's like to make to do hard work, and believe me, I'd much rather practice law. Than, <laughs> than work so, what in a kind of law do you practice? I do mortgage foreclosure defense work. I've been doing that for uh, 30 years. I've been here in Palm Beach County for 40 years. Um, when I started out, I, I did uh, work for an insurance defense firm called Brennan McAlilly Albury and Hayscar. Um, I um, they they tried to get me to do work comp appeals. If you know anything about work comp and appeals. Um, that's blending two of the worst, bo most boring areas of law into one. So it was terrible. And, and so I decided to go off on my own. I took one insurance defense uh, uh, company with me, uh, Fortune Insurance Company. I used to call them Misfortune Insurance Company. <laughs> and um, did insurance defense work for a while. And kind of, since that was the only um, client I took with me, I had to do everything else that walked in the door. I did, did everything, criminal, divorce, um, some personal injury plaintiff work, some mortgage work, and then um, eventually um, I um, uh, concentrated in uh, some consumer protection law, uh, truth in lending, RESPA, things like that, and blended them into a mortgage foreclosure defense practice where I learned how to try to save people's homes, try to keep them in the property and save, and save the homes for them. And I've been doing that exclusively now for 40 years, for 30 years. Well, I know that's kind of, some of that has kind of lead you into your most current venture, and you're a little bit concerned about what's going on in the political climate, and, yeah. and specifically kind of in education. Let's talk all about a little bit your concerns about education. Yeah, I, my concerns is, uh, of the education is that we've been starving the education system by funneling uh, money from the school system into other areas to cover budget uh, matters. Um, we've, um, the, the school system has lost um, um, essentially billions of dollars by diverting money from the school system uh, to uh, other areas in the budget. Um, and a lot of it occurred when we had the mortgage meltdown and the recession when revenues uh, were, went down for the, uh, the, from the legislature because um, uh, our economy is driven by consumer. It's, it's sales tax, use tax, things like that. So that's consumer-driven economy, which means it's consumer-driven revenue for the state primarily. Uh, and when you, you don't have those sales in use, you don't have tourists coming down, which occurred in the recession, you lost money. So this, the, the education system starved for several years. Um, and, and, but as we made a comeback, they've not replaced that revenue for the teachers. They haven't gotten a significant raise in several years and the, the money going to the students per year for the past 10 years has only increased by $100 if you exclude the money that was allocated last year in the Parkland measure. And most of that money did not go to the students. That money went primarily to hardening the schools. Uh, money for, for example, to pay for more security guards. Money to pay for uh, uh, giving teachers guns, which I I'm opposed to, but that's where the, a lot of that money went to. So overall, for 10 years, this, the, the teachers have just not gotten a pay raise. The students have not gotten the adequate funding for um, um, uh, raising the educational level that needs to, we need to in order to compete in a modern economy. Now, does that also apply once you get past education? What about Medicare and things like that? Well, um, that's 
you know, I never understood why we declined Medicaid, Medicaid expansion. Um, I, I, there's some studies out, the Robert Wood Foundation and the Johnson Foundation did a s joint study and examined the effect of declining uh, the Medicaid expansion uh, when um, Governor Scott vetoed the bill that would have accepted Medicaid expansion. Over the last 15 years, or for the next 15 years rather, from the date it was declined to 15 years out from there, we have lost $86 billion in revenue from um, from the Medicaid expansion declination. What that means is that it, it is that um, that would have been $86 billion fed into the economy, which would have went into doctors' pockets, nurses' pockets, testing companies' pockets. That has a multiplying effect in the economy uh, when, you, when you put that kind of money directly into people's pockets, they spend it. Especially the lower income people, they, they put it back in the economy and, and it has a multiplying effect of about two or three times. So when you spend a dollar, when you give a dollar to, uh, say, uh, a nurse, uh, and, and, and that dollar multiplies with respect to the economy because she's got to buy groceries, she's got to um, you know, pay the rent, she's got to do a number of things with that dollar. So that's the multiplying effect we left out. On top of that, by not accepting the Medicaid expansion, people were not given medical care, which means that, w that compounded people's suffering. People couldn't get medical care, they, they, they were hurting, and, and couldn't get treatment for what they wanted. And, Obviously, when you don't get medical care, you shorten people's lives, and the shortened lives are more painful for them. So I thought it was wrong on a number of levels f to refuse Medicaid expansion when we did. And, 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 and so I think what Florida needs to do is to accept that Medicaid expansion. Okay. Tell us a little bit about... Um, and one other thing about that, that's our tax money. In other words, sure. that, that's, you know, we pay um, money to the federal government in the form of taxes, and since we didn't get that money, it went to other states. So we're giving other states our tax money that should have come back to us in the form of accepting Medicaid expansion. So sorry about that. No, that's good. So all, because of these reasons, you decided to run for state house, which in today's current political climate isn't an easy thing. Okay, it, it I mean you're not. putting yourself out there, and I mean we just saw someone, we just saw Kavanaugh run for, um, or he got appointed to Supreme Court, and we just saw what he went out went through, right? And yes. you're putting yourself and you're putting your family through a tremendous amount of stress going through um, running through public office. What made you decide to put yourself out there and put your family through going through um, this process? Well, jokingly, I tell people I must be dumber than a box of rocks, <laughs> <laughs> but 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 seriously. Um, um, I have been involved in Ocean Ridge for 18 years, 13 years on the Planning and Zoning Commission, uh, first as vice chair and then chairman, now, and I'm a two-term commissioner, one year I served as the vice mayor, and I'm now currently the mayor. District 89 is an intercoastal district. Um, it's East Boca, East Delray, Southeast Boynton, and everything east of Federal Highway all the way up through Singer Island, so I get both sides of the intercoastal as part of my district. So. Um, I have seen all of the issues and had to deal with all of the issues that the district is going to face from uh, saltwater intrusion, sea level rise, um, flooding that's attendant with the sea level rise, beach renourishment, beach restoration, dune preservation, mangrove preservation, uh, growth. Uh, we've had to control some of the growth in, in Ocean Ridge, um, um, the uh, opioid crisis. And, and sober home issues, I've had to deal with every one of them in my capacity, either as a planning and zoning commissioner or as a commissioner on, and, and I'm really focused on, on the um, issue of saltwater intrusion, sea level rise, and the flooding, because um, of the cost, the enormous cost involved to a town. Our town, Ocean Ridge, has a budget of about $7 million as of this year, okay? It's a small community, it's about 2,000 people. Several years ago, uh, I want to say around 2003, 2004, we had to put in a retention detention pond in, which was designed to pump water from the south end of the town, about you know, several acres of town, about a third of the south end of the town. They had flooding issues, so we pump, you know, put in a pumping system and drainage system to pump the water into this retention detention pond. It works by gravity, you've got to dig a big pit, it's essentially a, a big sink. And, and then you gravity feed the, you, you, you run it through there, it has to sit for about 30, 45 days, you put it on one end, slowly goes to the other end through pipe system and uh, vegetation, 
takes out all the, I call the fertilizer and the, the, the dog pee and the poo and the stuff that goes through there. But I mean, it's fertilizer, nitrogen, phosphorus. Sure. It gets, the plants use that. And then the stuff that is not um, 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 organic, like, um, you know, dirt and gr uh, debris that the washes in there from the road, the rubber uh, um, um, residue that washes in from the road, things like that, the pesticides, they precipitate to the bottom. And then eventually when it gets out to the to discharge pipes, um, it, ca it goes out as clean water. And sure. that's how you get the permits to do that. And it's, since it's gravity fed, we're about, it's about, we're about eight feet above sea level, so it's about, you know, to, to get that margin to hold enough water, we have the pi discharge pipes about, about six feet, uh, um, above, uh, about four, uh, two feet above sea level, so there's a six foot difference. Well, as we now have gotten to um, um, sea level rise, when we have the high tides, the the high water backs up, gets gets higher than the discharge pipes, and salt water backs up into the system, which you can't have that. So we've had to retrofit those with what's called duckbill valves, which close when when you have the high tides. The problem is that this is a fairly new system, um, and number one, it costs seven million in two thousand three, two thousand four dollars. We'll fast forward to 2018 as we get more flooding, and a lot of the communities are getting more flooding. Our town is getting a little bit more flooding. Um, it's going to cost a factor of two, three times that for a much larger system, and we had no land acquisition cost. We, we own the land through which the water is being discharged and stored. So, and what land is now available in any of the island communities are all along the intercoastal to hold enough water to discharge, you know, to to go through this process to cleanse it and discharge it back in the intercoastal. It's going to be a huge undertaking. You're talking, for our community, probably 20, 30, 40 million dollars. We don't have the budget to do that. The state's going to have to come in and help us. And as I pointed out, this is a newer system. Some of the older systems, for example, we have, we have some drainage pipes that um, drain some of the water directly from the roadway into the intercoastal, but those, and those are also gravity fed, but those are lower. So those pipes are even lower than the discharge pipes, and eventually the salt, the water is going to cover them up 100%. And what it also means for our higher discharge pipes is that at some point in time, they're going to be covered 100% of the time, which means you're going to have to pump the water out. Right. Um, and you're going to need more land because all this is is a big sink. When you make the sink shallower, um, we, um, it's been now made two inches shallower by saltwater intrusion. In other words, we have, a, we have salt water in, in, intruding in the limestone bedrock, um, and that in the fresh, we have a fresh water table. We measured it when we first built that, and we measured it when we cleaned this out. It's gone up two inches, which means the saltwater intrusion has forced the fresh water up by two inches, which makes our, 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 our sink shallower. And it's some, so you're going to need a bigger volume right. to hold this water. And at some point in time, the communities are all going to have to do that, and 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 it's going to be a huge, expensive proposition. And we all, from from Boca to um, Highland Beach, to Delray Beach, Ocean Ridge, Manalapan, Lake Worth, take Lake Worth, and that's what made you want to run for state senate. I, I get the problem. I understand it, and and so I understand what all the island and the intercoastal communities need, they need money, they need help from the state in order to address these problems. Because it not, not only is it, a, it is a water problem, it is a property value problem. If you have a home, on what doesn't make any difference what side of the intercoastal it's on. If you have a home that's constantly flooding and you can't get the flood water out in a reasonable amount of time, you, your property values are going to go down. And so, you're, and, and, and let, let's say you have a drive with a, with a little steep slope to it. And, and water's sitting at the bottom of the drive, three or four feet, you, you're going to ruin your car. Right. So, so it's, it's an economic property value issue on top of a ecological issue. Sure. And, and so I think there's a big need for somebody who recognizes this problem and can explain it in these kinds of terms to his fellow legislators and get them to agree that, hey, we need to do something about this problem now. It's, a, it's, it's, it's more of a midterm problem, but you know, there's a new study that came out now uh, uh, in the last couple of days that said, you know, we've got till about 2040 to address the problem because it's going to be irreversible and it's going to cause huge flooding problems. So 
who, I mean, who knows when it's going to happen? It definitely is happening. Take, like I said, take Lake Worth. That community had three artesian wells. Um, they were drilled to supply the, the drinking water for the town. Um, the saltwater intrusion forced them to close those three artesian wells down and move farther west. They also have a problem with their golf course, which is right on the intercoastal. The, the, salt, the, the, the sea level rise has now been eroding away the edges of the golf course and, and it's going to be an impossible amount of money for the town of Lake Worth to address. It's going to be a huge problem. So I, I understand that. I want to do something about it. I want to help my community, Ocean Ridge. I want to help all the intercoastal communities deal with that, that problem. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank appreciate you. you uh, meeting you. Thank Great. you very much. I appreciate you being here. Thank you for having us. Thank you for watching The Book of Voice. We look forward to seeing you this week on Fact or Fiction Friday.